welcome to the 2012 International Residential Code Update webinar. My name is Dave Bowman and I'll be taking you through the first part of the uh, webinar on the subjects of uh, building planning, uh, building uh, structural construction, and uh, energy requirements. It's important to have an up-to-date up uh, residential construction code addressing the design and construction of one and two family dwellings and townhouses to protect the health and safety of the public as well as provide affordable housing. There have been some key changes made to the International Residential Code since the 2009 edition. This webinar will identify important changes in the IRC from 2009 to 2012 edition. Participants will be presented with those changes that will most impact the use of their code when they adopt the 2012 IRC. Our goal is to allow you to be able to identify changes from the 2009 IRC to the 2012 IRC and allowing you to apply these code requirements to the design, plan review, and or inspection that, uh, in your everyday lives. The first area that we will be discussing are uh, chapters one and two, chapter one being the uh, scope and administration chapter. First change that we want to talk about is to change to the scope of the code. Essentially what happens has happened in this uh, code change to R101.2 is that we've expanded the scope of the IRC a little bit. Uh, we now have an exception to the scope that allows the IRC to be applied to a thing called owner-occupied lodging houses when uh, there are five or fewer guest rooms in that uh, lodging house. The typical lodging house that we're talking about is a bed and breakfast. This is significant because in the past everything that we've uh, uh, included in the, in the scope of the IRC has essentially been permanent residences. Uh, in other words, people that are uh, uh, intending to live there for several months or years or the rest of their lives. Uh, now we have an accommodation in the code for a thing uh, called owner-occupied lodging houses which are transient type of residential units. Hey, based on new data and research performed over the past 10 years, and improvements in modeling of the coastal high wind events, hurricane wind speeds have been adjusted downwards. To update and coordinate the provisions of the 2012 IRC with the 2010 edition of ASCE 7, the results of this data are reflected in the new map for nominal basic wind speed, which is figure R301.2 parens 4A. Here, is that new map. Another new map has been introduced to specifically indicate the geographic locations that require wind design. In this context, wind design means an engineered design in accordance with the International Building Code or ASCE 7 or a design in accordance with the applicable provisions of uh, ICC Standard 600 or the Wood Frame Construction Manual or, or a standard AISI, which is the uh, American, Insist uh, American Iron and Steel Institute, Standard S230. The areas indicated as requiring wind design on the map generally correspond to areas with a nominal wind speed of 110 miles per hour or greater. There is a copy of the, that wind map, and as you can see, uh, along the uh, southeast coast of the United States and the entire panhandle of Florida and the Gulf Coast are shaded regions, and those are areas that require uh, uh, wind design rather than using the prescriptive requirements given in the uh, IRC. And we have another new map related to wind design. And that is a, a map called Windborne Debris Regions. 
This is a, a map that delineates areas where uh, windborne debris uh, regions are, are in hurricane pro, uh, areas of the Atlantic and Gulf Coasts. The definition of a windborne debris region has also been revised to delete references to wind speed and proximity to the coast in favor of just simply referencing the new map. Protection of glazing to resist impact from windborne debris must be designed in accordance with the large missile test of ASTM E1996 based on the wind zone shown in figure R301.2 parens 4C. The exception allowing the use of 7 16 inch wood structural panels to protect glazed openings remains in place but now it references wind zones 1 and 2 in the new map and deletes mention of the wind speed. Moving on to, from, uh, from the uh, discussion of wind to uh, section R302.1 and table R301.1 parens 2 regarding exterior walls. Uh, this section has been revised to add a new table for minimum fire separation distance for dwellings equipped throughout with an approved automatic sprinkler system. The minimum clearance to uh, lot lines have been reduced from 5 foot to 3 foot for unrated exterior walls when the dwelling is protected with a fire sprinkler system. The code now permits construction of unrated exterior walls on the lot line when all dwellings in the subdivision are protected with automatic fire sprinkler systems and the opposing lot maintains a minimum 6 foot clearance from the common lot line. Provisions that regulate the construction of exterior walls in proximity to lot lines have long been recognized as effective in preventing the spread of fire from a building on one property to a building on another property. Unless the exterior wall is constructed to provide fire resistance rating of one hour with exposure from both sides in accordance with ASTM E119 or UL263, a minimum fire separation distance is required from the lot line. The consensus as to the minimum distance necessary to provide sufficient buffer against the spread of fire has changed somewhat over the years. For example, the 2000 and 2003 editions of the IRC required a minimum three foot separation from lot lines for unrated exterior walls. In the 2006 edition, that distance was increased to five foot to provide a higher level of safety and to correlate with the IBC. Then the 2009 IRC introduced requirements for automatic fire sprinkler systems in all one and two family dwellings and townhouses. When a sprinkler system is installed, the 2012 IRC now permits non-rated walls that are not less than three foot from the lot line, a dimension previously prescribed in the earlier editions of the code for unrated walls. In section uh, 501.3 regarding uh, that we, we now have a new section that is, uh, requires fire protection of floors. Installation of half inch gypsum board, 5 8 inch wood structural panel or other approved material is now required on the underside of floor assemblies of dwelling units and accessory buildings constructed under the IRC. This change addresses concern for firefighter safety and incidents of injury or death to firefighters while fighting residential fires due to the collapse of floors. The application of gypsum wallboard or other approved material intends to provide some protection to the floor system against the effects of fire and delay the collapse of the floor. There are four exceptions provided that specify where the protection is not required. This change adds protection to the floors of lightweight construction that will provide the occupants additional time for self-evacuation and fire safety for firefighters performing search and rescue. Another interesting uh, 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 new section of the code has been added regarding photovoltaic modules and shingles. This adds provisions for material and installation of uh, photovoltaic modules and shingles. These shingles are integrated with the building and provide a roof covering and a source of electric power. An increasingly popular way of uh, providing power now is through 
uh, photovoltaic systems that convert sunlight to electrical energy and provide considerable savings in, in uh, uses of the uh, electrical energy uh, commercial uh, sources uh, for homes. But, however, they're providing, you know, they're a convenient system, we have to be mindful of the uh, requirements that uh, we have for roof shingles, that they're constructive materials that are resistant to flame. And uh, uh, the requirements in the code now address some of those issues regarding flame spread on a roof and, uh, and flame resistance. Hello, my name is Greg Gress. I work for the International Code Council. And today we're gonna to be talking about the 2012 International Residential Code. Uh, specifically, we're going to be talking about the significant and noteworthy changes that have been made since the 2009 edition. There have been many changes made between the 2009 and 2012 edition, but we're only going to talk about the ones that were significant, uh, the most interesting, and the ones that probably need some explanation. So with that, I'll get started. We're focusing on chapters 12 to the end. First item is section 1301.5. This is a significant change. The same change also occurred in the International Mechanical Code, International Fuel Gas Code, and International Plumbing Code. And it, it's a big step forward in that it now requires all pipe, tubing, and fittings to be in effect listed. Before, we just kind of took the manufacturer's word for it because they may have put something on the box or stenciled something on the pipe that said it met a particular standard, but we had no verification that it actually did. So we now have two new definitions for uh, third-party certified and third-party tested. And if you read those, they read very similar to, the, to that definition of listed. So in effect, this really is requiring pipe tubing and fittings to be listed because a third-party agency has to verify that these products meet the standards specified in the code or meet whatever other criteria the code specifies. So uh, it doesn't say listed, but in effect, it's the same thing in that it's requiring uh, a third party to uh, look at the product, uh, verify, and in some cases follow up with surveillance of the manufacturing facility. So it's very similar to being listed and this was never required in any of the previous codes. So this is a, a big deal in that pipe tubing and fittings uh, for virtually any purpose in plumbing, mechanical, and fuel gas are in effect listed now. 